Is his name beautiful? Yes. Is his name powerful? Yes. Is his name gracious? You better believe it. No under na- name under heaven by which men may- and women may be saved but the name of Jesus. Do you believe that this morning, church? So true, isn't it? Good to be with you. Psalm 22, turn there if you would. So good to worship with you in song and so good to worship with you just in hugs and greetings and now we get to worship together through God's word and uh, perhaps the big news story of the week is what transpired in a Texas courtroom when a young brother give it up for Texas courtrooms I didn't know that was an exciting topic um where a young man by the name of Brant John from the witness stand extended an act of forgiveness to one Amber Geiger who was condemned to 10 years of prison because of the death of Brant's brother, Botham. And uh, from the witness stand, we saw something that we usually don't see in a courtroom situation, especially when a loved one has been senselessly murdered. Brandt asked to give the convicted murderer a hug. Before giving her a hug, he talked about his own faith and how he wanted Amber to know Jesus Christ. And more than a verbal desire, he demonstrated something perhaps some of us would would find hard to to do. And that's to hug somebody who had killed one of your your family members. And uh, there was not a dry eye in that courtroom that day. Nor was there probably a dry eye among not only those who were watching it at at, at a national scale, but an international scale. These things don't happen in courtrooms. And then to make the situation all the more interesting and awesome, the judge (laughs) steps forward and gives the convicted murderer a Bible and issuing the same desire for her to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Why did this go viral? Why was this the top news story of the week? Because we don't see acts of forgiveness put on display like that. And the reason we don't see it is because people don't know that kind of forgiveness divorced from having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Only the love of Jesus compels somebody to act like that. It's probably why hours after this situation went viral, You have atheist groups coming out saying what that judge did was wrong. Immediately trying to squash the beauty of the moment. How dare that judge give that woman a Bible. Someone find something in law that's illegal. Like Just like those who don't want God don't know how to embrace forgiveness put on display. Now, the other part of the story that probably many of you don't even know, the video that didn't go as viral as Brant's act of forgiveness and the judge's act of giving this woman a Bible is what Brant's mom did. Not that she disagreed with forgiveness that her son extended, but the mom came out and issued a demand for justice. And I think the topic of forgiveness and justice is important. Because there can be no true forgiveness without proper justice. Because here's what mom said. Mom said, how dare there be weaknesses in our legal proceedings, such as when the officers went to Botham's apartment, they turned off their body cam." Lest they find something that they didn't want discovered, the mother cried, why? Because if we're going to be fair, 
We need to have all the evidence. Something needs to be done because there are fissures, there are cracks, there are weaknesses in our judicial practices. And I think we would all agree with that. While we want forgiveness, we also want justice. Now here's the difficulty of it. Justice in a system where men and women are fallible. Where we're culpable. Where there's things that we just don't want brought into the light and we're kind of like, let's just turn a blind eye to it. Now here's the overarching beauty of the whole story. What we celebrate as followers of Christ is perfectly, without error or mistake, forgiveness and justice perfectly executed on a hill called Golgotha. On an instrument of cruelty called a cross. And made complete and perfect through the sacrifice of one, Jesus the Christ. In the cross... We have forgiveness and justice perfectly married in a fashion where those who come beneath that instrument of death find fr freedom and liberty. What a beautiful name it is, you better believe it. What a powerful name it is, you better believe it. Your love defends me. Because when God steps in and says, I want to be your defense, you take it. Because there's no one and nothing else on this earth that's going to defend you like God will defend you. If you come beneath that crimson flood, bathed in the blood of Christ to find forgiveness for your sins. Can I get an amen, church? See, what we witness this week is merely scratching the surface of what is really found in the love, the forgiveness, the justice that we find at the cross of Christ. Today, we get to stand before that once again. Today, we get to hopefully be ushered to that place before the cross and perhaps see the cross like we've never seen it before. The very thing that our hearts are longing for, to be, to be forgiven, is found there. The very reminders of what God does as far as justice is found there. The only law of liberty and freedom is to be discovered there. Because without the cross we are nothing, but with the cross we are everything. And so we go back a thousand years before the cross to a, a man by the name of David. Who writes a psalm, Psalm 22, which is really a psalm of the cross. Now check this out. Turn your Bibles. 31 verses. We have before us what many have called the fifth gospel. We know the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Ringo. No, he's not in there, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But here's what's interesting. These were all contemporaries. These are all men who were eyewitnesses of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And yet we can add a fifth gospel. David, though he wasn't present, he existed a thousand years before Jesus and yet wrote of the cross. This, ladies and gentlemen, is remarkable. Because we have this fifth gospel before us and it talks about things that hadn't even been invented yet. What we have before us is a literal evidence of the supernatural nature of the Bible. What we have before us is an account of something that in the end can only be ascribed to God. What David writes about here has nothing to do with David's life. He has to be writing about someone else. And according to Acts chapter 2 verse 30, the, Peter calls David a prophet because David is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and foreseeing something that's going to happen a thousand years later. It's like if a thousand A.D., we're talking the Middle Ages, someone wrote a document and said a thousand years from now, there would be those from a foreign land that would hijack metallic birds and take those metallic birds and fly them into the tallest buildings in a large city and kill thousands of people. And you would sit there and go, this is remarkable. How did they see something back then that didn't take place a thousand years later? You would certainly ascribe something supernatural to that document. 
Well, what we have before us is exactly that. And good reasons to believe that this is about Jesus and not David. Let me just give you a few. There's no recorded events in David's life that correspond to the details we're going to read here. Number two, this psalm contains no mention of the psalmist's personal sin, confession of sin, or even regret for the pains that he was suffering. Number three, this psalm has specific phrases that can only be used of somebody undergoing crucifixion. And number four, there is no call for God for vindication for wrongs suffered. All those things that are usually typical of a psalm are not here. This is a unique psalm. And so what we have in Psalm 22 is literally this a script for Jesus' final hours on the earth. And more than a script, we get to understand the mindset of Christ himself while he hung upon a cross for hours that one fateful Friday. This is something that the other gospel writers touch on but don't give us the complete picture like Psalm 22 does. Now, it's interesting because Psalm 22 comes before Psalm 20. You guys are smart. You're you're dialed in. Psalm 23 is the famous, the Lord is my shepherd. The reason this comes before Psalm 23 is you cannot know God as shepherd unless you first know him as Savior. He is not just your shepherd Savior, but he's going to be the shepherd one who brings you satisfaction. And ultimately, he is the one in Psalm 24 who is the ascended victorious one. There's an order of sequence here you have to understand. You must first know him as Savior if you're going to understand him as shepherd. And when you understand him as shepherd, you know he's sovereign. He's got all things under control, and he's going to have ultimate victory. Maybe some good time to read this week in the Word, Psalm 22, 23, 24. Read them over and over and over and watch what God does. So here we are, Psalm 22. Let's read it in its entirety. And then as we're reading it, just think about what we've we've talked about. There are no less than nine fulfilled prophecies found in this chapter when it comes to the death of Jesus Christ. Verse 1, and right out of the gate, words that are familiar to most of us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O oh, you who are enthroned above the praises of your people, upon the praises of your people, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you did deliver them. And to you they cried out and they were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag their head, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord and let him deliver him, because if he has saved others, how come he cannot save himself? Yet you are he who did bring me forth from the womb. You did make me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. But not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my joints are out of joint. Bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you have laid me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. You, O Lord, have not, have been fought, not far off. You have been my help. Hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You do answer me. And now there's a shift in the tone. I will tell of your name to my brethren. 
In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. And afflicted, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. And all the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive posterity will serve him it will be told of the lord to the coming generation they will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done it or it is finished should we just go home right now because it's pretty self-explanatory isn't it again what we hold in our hands is not just a a New York Times best-selling book. What we hold in our hands is the living, active, supernatural work of God who is saying to us in 1000 BC, there is an event coming that is going to be so horrific that people will question its validity. It w- they will doubt its veracity. But not only is that event horrific, it will end up with so- being something so glorious that the world will be changed as a result of it. See, what we see here are two pieces, and this is what we're going to talk about this morning. There's the trials of the Savior, point number one, and then the second point are, is going to be the triumph of the Lord. Friday was dark, but Sunday's a-coming, right? Friday looked pretty bleak, but Sunday morning was certainly beautiful, amen? See, what we have to understand is that God did a miraculous event, uh, event through his son on that cross, on that good Friday. And David unpacks the details of this so that we understand what God endured for you and I. Now, as I mentioned, what is remarkable, just in this one chapter, chapter 22 of Psalms, we have no less than nine fulfilled prophecies. There are 300 total in the Old Testament pertaining to Jesus. Here we have no less than nine. Now, I'm going to tell you right now the statistical odds of any one person fulfilling even six. Go ahead, just pick six of them is one to the 10th, 17th power. So for those of you that haven't been in school a while, and it has nothing to do with new math, thank God, 10 followed by 17 zeros. The statistical odds of one person fulfilling this kind of prophecy is much like filling the state of Texas. Anyone ever driven across Texas? That's quite a feat right there. That should be listed as a miracle in case any of you want to qualify for sainthood one day. Drive across Texas. Fill the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep. Mark one of those silver dollars with an X. Randomly throw it out. Take somebody, blindfold them, take them about 30,000 feet up in an airplane, throw them out of the airplane over the state of Texas. They get one pick and they pick that one silver dollar with the X on it. That's the statistical odds of one person fulfilling six prophecies. Here we have no less than nine prophecies. And I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Ladies and gentlemen, we truly stand upon holy ground. Ladies and gentlemen, we certainly hold something in our hands that we treat like a loaf of bread. And one preacher said it ought to be viewed like a stick of dynamite. What we hold in our hands is the living testimony of a God who says, I'm not going to live without you, but I'm going to die for you so I can live with you forever. And our hearts should be transformed as a result of this. This is truly amazing. As we consider, number one, the trials of the Savior. Notice this. There are three trials that are mentioned here in the the first 21 verses. 
The first of the, is this. It's, it's the trial of separation. And truly some of the most haunting words throughout Scripture. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the cry from abandonment. This is the moment when the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, was a, it felt abandoned by God. This is a cry of utter distress, not a cry of distrust. We must understand this. It expresses the agony of grief, but not the misery of doubt. There is relationship that is intact, but there is silence. There's the absence of something that was there that's not being experienced at the moment. The why implies a, a, an, an, an innocence that as far as his life, his moral life is concerned, doesn't seem to work. Why? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm the one who has been innocent, without sin, living a perfect life, and why would now be the hour that I feel abandoned? See, this is the mind of Christ, that he's on a cross, and he cries out this, this, these, this phrase. And it's not like Jesus was on the cross and said, what Bible text would apply to this moment right here, right now? That, that's not what's going on. It's not like, boy, I wish I had a Bible verse handy for this moment to get, really get me through the situation. Christ is the word. He didn't have to memorize the word. He's the one who explains the word. He's the one who gives the word meaning. He's the one who defines everything in our scripture. Just like on the road to Emmaus with those two disciples. After the resurrection, they're walking with Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus. And they said, boy, when he's with us, the word just, it seems to burn within us. Because Jesus is the one who says to them, the words of the Old Testament, the prophets spoke of me. The law speaks of me. The psalms speak of me. And so what the psalmist is describing here is not just you know, one verse application. How does this fit in your life, Jesus? No, he's living it. Because he is that word suffering, experiencing this abandonment. The one who is the eternal delight of the Father. The one who is the radiance of the Father's glory. The one who has the exact imprint of the Father's nature. The one who is the earthly visible image of the Father. Meets with unholiness at this moment. Sin at this moment. moment uh, messiness at this moment. And cries out from his heart, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is no way in our mortal minds can we understand or fathom the distance the Son felt at this moment from the Father. See, while we don't worship three gods, we worship one God who makes himself known in three persons, there is a true experience of abandonment that's felt. And all I can think about is that for the first time in Jesus' life where we have in Jesus 100% deity yet 100% humanity in the deepest place of his humanity where he most identifies with us, he felt God was not there. And why is this? Because God is so holy, he can have nothing to do with sin. He can't even look at it. And here upon this cross is this transaction where Christ bears our sins. He bears the Father's wrath. And at a moment, the Father turns his back on the Son. And the Son experiences something he's never experienced before. Distance between him and the Father. Have you ever felt abandoned in your life? Have you ever uttered the words like Jesus? Though not even at the same level as far as the gravity and weight. Boy, I tell you what. Here is Jesus experiencing this abandonment, not just in himself, but for us who would believe. That you would never have to face abandonment before a holy God. As a child, I was, I was fearful that I would lose my parents. I had one dream as a child 
that was just this reoccurring dream. Did anyone ever, you ever had this? Like, there's that one dream, and I'm not talking about the dream where you go to school and you forget all your homework at home, and you can't break out of the school because it's like a prison. You know, everyone has that dream, amen? All right, so I'm talking about the dream that I had re- repeatedly as a child where all my family left to get in the car to go on a trip, and I ran to the screen door, and I couldn't open the door, and I watched them leave in the car and take off. That was one dream I had over and over and over again. And there were moments I woke up, and I remember one night I woke up, and I ran out. I was probably nine, ten years old. And I ran out to my parents, and I hugged them, and I was crying. I said, I don't want you guys to leave. I don't want you guys to die. And they're like, we're here. Nothing's going to happen to us. We're here, but as a child, you fear certain things. Here is Christ at a level we could never understand, experiencing utter abandonment from God. Not just bearing (laughs) my sins, but bearing the sins of all those who would believe in him. Let me just say, I'm crushed under the weight of my own sins. How about you? Much less the billions of people that would know him as, as Lord one day. He's bearing their sins while I'm crushed under the weight of my own sins. And not only that, he's bearing the wrath of the Father. See, because of the holiness of God, he must do something against sin, and that is he pours out his anger upon that which is in direct opposition to his character and his nature. And it's on that cross that God's wrath and our sin are poured out on the innocent lamb of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From the cry of abandonment, we have the comfort of God's holiness. Notice verse 3. See, the psalm, (laughs) it doesn't build up to some climatic moment. It starts at the climatic moment. Verse 1, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But yet, here's, while we have the cries, here's what the psalm does so perfectly. It brings us comfort. Because if you feel abandoned, you, you may feel abandoned for a night, but joy's going to come in the morning. I, I believe this. See, while the son experienced abandonment, it wasn't for forever. It was momentary, right? Because he ultimately found comfort in God's holiness. Look at verse 3. What does it say? It says, yet... You are holy. Meaning there's something so true about God's nature and his holiness that he is morally perfect. He is without mistakes. He is flawless. And lest you think that God somehow stepped away from your life and he's not uh, observing what's going on with you or he's forgotten you, let me just tell you, ever since the very beginning, he's very much in tune with what's going on with you, me, and everybody else. And here's what's so great about God's holiness is that he's demonstrated his holiness throughout the centuries, right? We can look back and look what the psalmist does. He says, our fathers trusted and then their fathers trusted and you prove them to be wrong and yourself to be true. That no matter what, God, you have proven your holiness and your faithfulness to the generations and there's no reason that I should doubt you today. Can I tell you right now, that is true comfort, ladies and gentlemen. Not the empty promises of some human person that says, ah, you'll be better tomorrow. What if I'm not? But God promising from eternity past that he will never let his children grow hungry, be abandoned, be unloved, that he is ours forever. So the separation may be brief in light of God's promises that are more substantial than our perceptions because our perceptions are limited. Would you not agree with that? So there's this first picture of of this trial of separation. Second is a picture or a trial of scorn. As if relational disconnect from the Father maybe the most supreme pain ever experienced in somebody, what about the scorn that we experience from other people? 
See, now the psalm turns from God to human relationships. Look at verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man. The reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me and separate with the lip. With them. They wag their head and they say, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. And specifically the wording there is, if he saved others, why can't he just save himself? Ladies and gentlemen, what we see from the gospel accounts is a savior who literally cries from abuse. See, not only does he feel abandoned, but there's abuse happening, verbal, physical abuse. We know what led out of the trials that Christ experienced. Six trials all night long, three Roman, three Jewish. In those trials, there was mocking, there was scoffing, there was spitting, there was beating, there was crown of thorns, there was, there was, a, there was the flagellation of the, the cat of nine tails. This man not only experienced verbal abuse, but physical abuse as well. And what could be more haunting than the people that you have created to praise you, mocking you? Because it is in him and through him that he created the world, and he's created the world to bring him glory. Now here are volitional instruments we call human beings with mouths designed to honor him who now only know derision. I mean, what's going through the Savior's mind as he's walking the Via Della Rosa, right? Carrying his cross. And there are people who just moments before were declaring, Hosanna, Hosanna. And now they're crying, crucify, crucify. And it did not stop. Every single step of the way, there was this reviling. There was this mocking Our Savior identified himself as a worm. Not just below the the angels, but even below humans. Remember what we talked about last week, Psalm 8, right? What is man that you should even consider him? Here Jesus says, I am lower than a person. I am literally a maggot that is utterly rejected. So dehumanized, that even physically he is beyond recognition. Isaiah 52, verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. We have no clue to the horrific treatment Jesus endured that people would not even recognize him. And his figure so contorted that many people looked away. Isaiah 53, verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Lower, subhuman, How could the Lord of glory be brought to such a basement? How could those who were created in his image treat him as horribly as they did? Here's the one before angels hid their faces out of praise and adoration and fear. He's now the target of mockery from those he created. And yet the cry from abuse turns into the comfort of God's faithfulness. Look at at verse 12. I mean, verse 9. Yet you, you God, now check this out. You did bring me forth from the womb. God, people are treating me like crap. People are treating me like trash. People are treating me like garbage. But yet you're the one who brought me forth from my mother's womb. Psalm 139, right? In my mother's womb, you were intimately acquainted and involved in my formation. And your faithfulness has been with me ever since conception. 
and conception and this pregnancy and birth. God, you have supervised this whole thing. And when I was an infant and a toddler and a young boy and, and growing up in stature and wisdom, right? What Luke 2 talks about. Here's what Christ says, you have known me and been faithful to me and there's not one second of the day nor one hair that's fallen from my head that you are not aware of. What, ha- what allows us to, to navigate the, the, the horrible treatment from people? Jesus says, you're reminded of the one who truly knows you, the one who's been faithful to you since conception, the Lord your God, who knows you better than anyone knows yourself. You find your comfort in him. People are going to say horrible things. People are going to do horrible things. But you find your comfort in God's faithfulness. You did make me to trust, even when I was at my mother's breast. Upon you I have cast my birth, from cast for my birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. See, that's God's faithfulness. Do you know that God's walking with you every single step, every single day? We're reminded of his presence. He's, he's there watching over our lives. And then the last trial is not just of separation and it's not just the trial of scorn, it's the trial of suffering. And we've already touched upon bearing the sins of of the world and bearing the wrath of God. But notice at verse 12, the litany of descriptions that we find complementary passages in the Gospels themselves. This is where the physical pain takes place. This is the culmination of suffering that is not just physical, but psychological. Notice in verse 12, there's a cry from agony. And it's really verses 12 through verses 18. And we're not going to go into them in their entirety, but I want to say this consider in the light of Isaiah, another great passage, chapter 53. Look at Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 4. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Then verses 7 and 8, Isaiah continues and says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. He opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for this generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. What we have to understand is what Christ has endured for us. And if I can, I just want to go through a, a list that's found here. And you can follow along in your, in your verses 12 through 18. We have a detailed description of what happened at the cross. Now, mind you, crucifixion had not even been invented as a form of execution at this time. Which makes this remarkable. Crucifixion had been invented about 60 years before Jesus. We're going a thousand years before Jesus. And here we have this detailed description of what happened at the cross. The first thing you see in verse 12 is that his life is surrounded. And it's not surrounded by those that were of his his nationality He's surrounded and he calls them dogs, which is a term for Gentiles. Those who are not of the the Jewish faith. He's surrounded by bulls. His life is surrounded like a pack of wild animals. And I tell you what, without God, people act like beasts. Amen? His life's surrounded, verse 12. His safety is threatened, verse 13. His bones are disjointed, verse 14. His heart is melted, verse 14. His strength is gone, verse 15. His mouth is thirsty. Remember when they lifted up the sponge and he did not take it? He, he suffered death to the extent that he wanted to identify with us. His mouth is thirsty, verse 15. His death was pre-planned. This is not an accident, but it was by the will of God that he wanted to bruise his son, Isaiah 53. His death is pre-planned, verse 15, right? It says, you have laid me in the dust of death. A deliberate act of God for our salvation. Hallelujah. His body is pierced. Verse 16. His bones are exposed. Verse 17. His clothes are divided. Verse 18. Here are the experiences of Christ found in the gospel. Suffered for us. And yet, the cry from agony 
is met with the comfort of God's sovereignty. That before the foundation of the world, God had planned this. Before the foundation of the world, God had the name of those he would save written in the Lamb's book of life. According to Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, before anything had ever been created, God had a plan to send his Son and save us from not just our sins, but God's wrath. Amazing grace, you better believe it. And now, here we come to the end of this section. And ladies and gentlemen, let's be honest. For those of us who have experienced what Christ has done for us, our hearts continue to to melt over the sacrifice given for you and I. We are moved by this demonstration of grace and mercy and kindness and compassion. And those of us who know what God has done for us, our cry is no longer, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know what our cry is now? My God, my God, why have you accepted me? Right? There's no forsakenness for those who know Jesus. There is now this this beautiful cry that says, I don't deserve it, I don't understand it, but you know what, I'm going to accept it. But Lord, remind me each and every day that you're a God who would rather die for me than live without me. And now my cry is, my God, my God, why have you even accepted me? And perhaps this is what makes communion so special and so important. It's for those that are called the children of God, for those of us who are sons and daughters of the Most High, because of what Jesus has done for us, that acceptance means the world. Because like I said, I know the weight of my sin. I know the fact that I am like a worm, a chief of sinners deserving no grace, and yet receiving it abundantly from God. I sit there and go, my God, my God, why? And so here we are as the people of God on Communion Sunday, having now just basked before the cross of Christ, having now just been under the flood of God's Word, His inspired Word in Psalm 22, and now we get to, through tears and through smiles, share the same sentiment that your pastor has been sharing with you, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? So what we've done today is that uh, I've asked Carol to play some instrumental piano music. I'm going to ask you, the people of God, to stand up this morning. And instead of passing out the elements, we've placed the elements in different places in the cafe. There's a couple in the back and there's a couple over here. What I want us to do is I want us to think about that cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as we're considering what he's done for us, I'm going to have a few important passages up on the screen that I'm just going to slowly read through. And as I read through these verses, and as Carol plays just some nice piano music, as you feel led, you walk out from where you're at and you go grab communion and make your prayer that, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? So let's stand. Let's stand together. As a church, as God's people, as his body, considering the magnitude of his love, the gravity of his grace, we can't help but be moved. We can't help but feel deeply what God has done for us. And as you feel led, you move out. And there's a plate there, and there's a plate in the back, and there's a plate over there, and I think there's a plate somewhere over there. But think about what Christ has done for us. He could have forsaken you and totally just and right to do it, but He has accepted us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as the music's playing, as we're reading Scripture, if you feel like you need to move out, move out. This is our organic time now, people. Christ... reconciling the world to himself 
not counting our sins against us, but entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God, through Christ, is making his appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And here it is, the the weight of it all. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ was the sinless one who stood in for the sinful ones so that in him we might become, we might receive that which was totally lacking in us, righteousness. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but love, serve one another. Galatians 3.13, if we can pull that up, it says, For he became cursed for us because it is written, Everyone who hangs upon a tree is cursed. He became the curse for us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Listen to this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And lastly, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses, we were dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him. What we hold in our hands this morning are elements of that new life. Having forgiven us of all of our sins, let me remind us of this. He has forgiven us all our sins. Ladies and gentlemen, what sins has God forgiven? All of them. That's good to hear that what Jesus endured for us was a complete and thorough cleansing. And by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, there's justice. He set aside those things and he nailed it to the cross so that we as God's people can cry, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? His body was broken for you so that you might have healing now and forever. Let's take and eat the bread together. And not only was his body broken for us, but his blood was shed for us. The blood that cleanses us from all of our sin. There's an old song that says, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And all who plunge themselves beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Who's for liberty today because of Jesus? We are. Who's for freedom because of Jesus today? We are. And let us take and drink of the cup together, remembering his blood shed for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us your son. For saving us from our sins. For giving us eternal life and eternal joy and eternal hope. Lord, the trials he endured certainly bring triumph to our lives today. Thank you for the gift of life in Christ. And all God's people said, amen. All right, second point. Thank you, Carol, for leading us. Sit down, church, if you would. We're not done yet. Because remember, there's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Right? The triumph, the trials that Jesus endured 
though dark and though tragic and though horrific, we are not left worshiping a dead Savior, someone with a Messiah complex, but we are worshiping the one who is risen from the dead, right? The triumphs of the Lord. The Savior who stood in for us is the same Lord over heaven and earth. Amen? And we have triumph in Him. And hence now, the psalm changes its tone. It ends with a note of encouragement and triumph. And it's this idea that now God dwells with His people. There are three things that God has now established, and this is meant to encourage us to take the message home and to our neighborhoods and to our communities. And that is three things that God has now created. He's created a great family, number one. He's creating a glorious kingdom, number two. And there is a generational blessing that is intact here in this passage. And let me just cover these quickly as far as closing encouragement for us today. And the reason these things are important is because even Hebrews says that though he endured the, the, the trials of the cross, notice he despised the shame because of the joy that was set before him. He endured the trials so that there could be triumph, right? He endured it for us so that we wouldn't know misery, but we would know hope. And so for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God, which is a place of reigning and ruling, ladies and gentlemen. Our God reigns. Did we not sing that this morning, Jacob? Thank you for picking that song. You didn't know we were going to be talking about that. And just by sheer of God's grace, we get to celebrate the fact that God reigns today. And he reigns tomorrow. And guess when else he reigns? The day after that. Is there a day that God doesn't reign? No. And he's creating a great family. Notice verse 22. It says that I will tell his name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. All who fear the Lord praise you. We are now part of that great family. We who were once abandoned by the world, left on the curb to die, unwelcome, unloved, unaccepted. God comes along and says, I want to adopt you into my family. And look at verse 24. I have this circled in my Bible, right? He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He's intimately acquainted with us, and now we can rejoice because neither has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, God heard. Rescue me, Lord. Save me, Lord. And God is there to do exactly that. Show you love. And now we're part of this great family. And the family is not just comprised of Jews, but it's comprised of Gentiles. And it's comprised of every single person who would believe because we do not worship a tribal deity. And as God is saving people, he is number two, making them into a glorious kingdom. We're in verse 25 and 26. It talks about the nations coming together. The fact that the banquet table of the Lord will be filled with not just those from the United States, but there'll be those from Ecuador. Amen? There'll be those from Bahrain. Amen? There'll be those from India. Amen? God is going to save people from all over the world, and we have an opportunity to share the love of Jesus with those so it's not just a a white-looking table. Right? It's not just an English-speaking table. As a matter of fact, God's going to give us a new name and a new language. Because he's tired of all the division. He says, I have a kingdom that's breaking forth, that's bringing together something more beautiful, a mosaic more glorious than you could ever imagine. God is saving people from all over this globe. Can you give an amen to that? And lastly, this has to do with generation upon generation upon generation. You're only here and know Jesus because someone was faithful to tell you about Jesus. Who was it that told you about Christ who was it that shared Jesus with you that there is a responsibility to leave a legacy and to leave a heritage you know what I don't care about is how much money you're going to leave your kids one day you know what I don't care about is what kind of boat you're going to leave your kids one day you know what I don't care about what kind of house you're going to leave your kids one day because one day you came into this world naked you're going to leave naked you're not going to take the boat the house or any of that stuff with you But there's one thing you can leave behind, and this is the greatest thing you can leave behind, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? That there is a generational blessing. It says in verse 30, posterity will serve him. Why? Because they will serve them who they've heard about, and they will only hear about it when you share the most glorious news with them. The fact that I have kids that I call not just my children, but their little disciples, and I pray they love Jesus. I pray they adore Jesus, and I pray that they will serve Jesus. 
and it will be told of the Lord to, to the coming generation. And they will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. Guess who's in verse 31? You and me. David's writing this 3,000 years ago, and yet in the mind of David, moved by the Spirit, Christ upon that cross was thinking of you and me. People not yet born. That's me, folks, because I'm not 2,000 years old. But yet Christ knew me by name. And he says, I'm going to save you, Scott Morgan. Who else? Who else's name was, was there at the cross in the Savior's mind? Was Lori's name there? Was your name there? How about you, Greg? Was your name there? Ron, how about your name? I know, hard to believe, but your name was there, I think. Cameron, I know, same thing with you. Grace, right? Janice, Becky, all of our names were in the Savior's mind because those who had not been born yet were born again in the Savior's mind. And praise God that when you were born, it was applied to your life. And the message that he has done it at the end of that verse, it is finished, rings so true. Because we walk through this life with a great burden of how do I make myself right with God? And God says, you do not make yourself right with me. I make it right for you. And now we as God's people, born again because of the grace of God, look at that cross and we say, hallelujah, what a savior. And we walk in the liberty that that cross affords and the freedom that that cross affords. And now we go forth sharing the message with people that God is making us into a great family and he's bringing together a glorious kingdom and that there are generations who still do not know Jesus and that is our greatest job to be occupied with, to make sure every single person hears and knows and hopefully accepts Christ as Lord. What do we say in all this? Hallelujah? Can you say it with some enthusiasm? Okay, almost good. Say it like you mean it now. All right. How about an amen like you feel it? Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that there's forgiveness through Jesus. Thank you that justice has been satisfied in Jesus. Thank you that the greatest courtroom scene in history has transformed our hearts and lives. That the transaction of an innocent Savior, taking upon himself the judgment, the guilt, the debt, the sins that we deserve. And yet clearing our debt and declaring us not guilty are some of the greatest words we can ever hear. The judge steps away from his position to take the punishment for us and cries out, it is finished. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation. Thank you for loving us. And may our cry be today and forever, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? May we walk in the beauty of that today and forever. And we pray this through the name of our loving Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face upon you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. We'll see you soon, all right?